Welcome back to the Wells Tech Podcast. This is episode 360, recorded on September 23rd, 2014. I'm Martin Spriggs. Show about technology, ministry, and hopefully everything or many things in between. Helping me ferret out everything in between is Sally Draper. Hi, Sally. Hi, Martin, and helping you mess things up, apparently, because I don't have the mind map correct. Today's September 22nd. We're recording on a Monday. That's what amazing. a strange thing, and I never updated the date in our notes, so yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm going to be out of the office tomorrow, so we decided to bump it back a date, and um, sorry for everybody that tuned in on Tuesday, uh, the 23rd, expecting to... Uh, to, to see us chatting as we normally do. That's not the case this week. Next week, we'll be back at usual time, usual place. So that's 4 o'clock Central. We try and do this for anybody who'd like to watch live. And really, the only reason that we do that, because really nothing that we say is so critical that it needs to be watched <laughs> in real time. But if you'd like to be a part of the show, we make that possible through Google Hangouts and the question and answer section that is there. So if you are live ever and can carve out 4 o'clock central on Tuesday afternoons, we, we welcome you to ask a question, make a comment, and we'll try and address it on the show. So that's the reason we try and keep it as rigid as possible. Life gets in the way sometimes. Always fun when people do comment and question and, and join the conversation in that way, Martin. And, you know, I guess I beg to differ. It might be worth it for people to be tuned in live with their pen and paper ready to take notes, don't you think? The little lead-in for our discussion today, Martin. She's already at it. Jab <laughs> right away. You know, she pulls out the props. Yeah. The pen and paper. So. I got nothing because I don't use pen and paper. But no, you're a digital note taker. Yeah. That's and that's that's really about. not the debate. We're talking about note taking tools, and of course, pen and paper are a part of the you know the conversation, of course. But with the advent of computers, with the advent of mobile devices, Sally. There is a plethora, so to speak, of tools, digital tools that will allow you to take and store and maybe most importantly, retrieve notes. And that's all part of the conversation as well. So what are the benefits of e, we'll call it e-note taking, um, from your perspective? Well, I think um, one thing is that you can organize things. You can have things in... Uh, collected around a topic or whatever it may be as opposed to um, some things may be digital, some things may be analog, uh, kept in different locations or whatever. You know that you're you're keeping all your, your notes, your important information in one place and maybe hopefully it's searchable, easy to find, well organized and I think um, that's a huge benefit and you know seriously there is paper in our lives but turning those paper notes and receipts and whatever it is that you need to save into this digital format and storing it with is a huge benefit. Right. So here's the deal. Um, let's take a simple project and almost all of us are involved with projects on a day in and day out basis. What kind of assets come into your digital life related to a project? Well you've got email, you know, lots of email. You have documents, you have maybe images, you have meeting notes, sometimes you have audio files, video files, links. Um, you know, the list goes on. Sometimes it's even um, chat conversations, I am chat conversations, all kinds of digital resources that come into your life that, that need to be kind of managed and related to one another in a, in, a, in a kind of a container. That's where I really struggled with all the digital tools at my disposal. I would create a folder, I'd create a folder on my hard drive, I'd maybe create a folder in Google Docs. I'd create a folder in Outlook, basically just there to contain the different things that come in a project. But none of those are associated with each other. And when I wanted to search for something uh, or share something or collaborate on something, it was, for me, it was almost impossible. So that's where these e-note-taking tools have really come in handy. And there are some, some really good ones at kind of bringing everything together in a way that I can do a simple search and I can find all the assets related to, let's say, a project or a meeting or a conversation. Um, and that's where I see the value and the benefit of some of these modern e-note-taking packages. So here I am, the old school 
digital gal um, who likes my folders in Outlook, who can find things in my folders in Outlook and my folders on my computer hard drive. And I, that's the way I think. You know, I feel like if I go with an e note taking tool, I'm going to lose a little control over that or things aren't going to be the same. And right. so, how do I make I, that jump? I felt that too. And then I started to figure out how I could bring my analog notes into my digital world and that's through you know these wonderful devices that we have either iPads or iPhones or you know things with a camera that can quickly take a snapshot of a piece of paper of a whiteboard uh, that can then bring that into your digital note-taking system and then some of the software even uh, does handwriting recognition where it'll be able to determine what it is you were writing even some of my crummy handwriting I've noticed that it has found and uh, that's been a real lifesaver as well so I really still only need to look in in one place for that kind of thing so you can get and we've talked about things in the past Sally, like live scribe and those kinds of tools where you've got a digital pen you can write on paper and it'll automatically pull that into some kind of note-taking system I, I still like the ability to take notes and scribble and draw lines and those kinds of things and I can still have that luxury but then take a quick picture and it's in my note-taking app. Lots of benefits there. You know, um, I like to take notes um, during sermons. And that's one of the habits that I've formed is taking notes during sermons. And I use a note-taking app, Notability, on my iPad. Um, and I use a stylus and I write on the screen and take notes just like I normally would. And I have a son away at college. So when the sermon is over and they're collecting the offering, I PDF those notes and email them to him right away. So he has the sermon notes as well. Right. So, um, you know, it does make it a lot more convenient for, for saving and sharing. I can search on the Bible passages of a particular sermon or whatever and find things easily as well. Yep. There are other tools too. For instance, the one that I use day in and day out and would really be lost without is OneNote. OneNote is a Microsoft product, so it obviously works on PCs, but it also works now on Macs and it works on iOS devices like an iPad, where you could take it in, you could use it in a similar way that you use Notability, scratch out your notes in a OneNote um, page and have it immediately in the cloud for your son to watch, or he could even collaborate on it with you. So they, they've thought about some of these issues that, uh, and OneNote, I think, got a foothold mostly with students, college students, you know, sitting sitting in class because it's got some other features like the ability to record audio or record video and embed that in your notes as well. I've got one note here. Let me see if I can quickly share this for those of you watching. Um, where is my one note? Right here. Um, so OneNote is one of those tools that tries to mimic what the analog world feels and, and looks like for, for people who kind of still like that. So OneNote is made up of notebooks. So I've got a couple of notebooks here. Active Projects is one of my notebooks. General is another one. I've got another one called Archive and I've got one called Personal. In those notebooks, and you kind of have to think of those notebooks as uh, uh, you know things that you would carry around, bound pages put together, they have things called tabs. So I have a tab in my Active Projects for each project that I'm working on. I have a Wells Mobile tab, I have a Strategic Plan tab, a Church 360 Partnership tab, and in each of those tabs are a series of pages. So those are just like single pages divided by tabs. So in my Wells Mobile tab, I have uh, notes from meetings, I have meeting, or I have uh, information that came in via email, maybe feature improvements or suggestions, bugs that have come in via email or other different applications. Uh, one thing that some of these note-taking apps allow you to do is embed files. So I could drag a Word document into a OneNote page and it would live in that OneNote page. So that now in one location I have the ability to collect all the information that I need to get a project done. But that's really only a third of it. The other third, one of the, sec the second third <laughs> is that I can share this. So if Sal, you and I were collaborating on a project, and all the note-taking tools do this. Evernote is one that we're going to mention here in a minute, too. Uh, I can share this with you and collaborate on it with you where I can give you permission to come in and make your own notes to this. And then the final third 
is searchability. So I've got all this information, and it used to be I had to search my Outlook, I had to search my file folder structure, I had to search, um, you know, maybe uh, you know, social network where or Google Plus where I was having conversations. Here I've got it all together where I can do a quick search. So let's say I'm working on the Wells mobile app, and I wanted to remember what the hex code was for Wells Red. Now I've got it up here on the screen, but I could uh, be on any other tab or any other notebook, and it says search all notebooks. All I would have to know is a certain phrase that I would use. Let's say Wells Red, and it would search through everything real quick and just show me the pages where that appears. And it could be a file name. It could be something in a file. Uh, it could be uh, almost anything that I've put in my OneNote. So I find this incredibly productive to be able to take this and um, just throw everything together in kind of a way that makes sense to me and uh, organize my life. Very good. How long have you been living in the OneNote ecosystem there? OneNote for about three years, and that's three the one years. that we use at the Synod level because it's a Microsoft product and lives and plays nicely on SharePoint. It just shares uh, it up there. And it'll also save to OneDrive now. Anybody with a Microsoft account gets a OneDrive account, and you have OneNote uh, at your disposal that way too. So it's... Um, uh, it's a tool that's at my fingertip. Now, the other big player uh, in the note digital note-taking space is what I used to use, and that's Evernote. And that has uh, equally powerful features. I just found OneNote to be a little bit more comfortable for me than, than Evernote. Very good. Um, and so, you know, kind of what ecosystem you're living in, or ecosystem, however you want to say that word, is, is going to maybe help you determine this, especially if you're into the Microsoft products. Certainly, right. OneNote plays nicely with those. But Evernote, like you said, is just as powerful. Um, we have a, an article we'll share a link to in the show notes about um, comparison of Google Keep versus OneNote versus Evernote. And there's so many pros for especially those two big players that it's almost hard to, to draw any kind of a winner out of yep. the situation. But right. but this article actually gave Evernote the nod for yep. what it's worth. You it's know, been around, I think, in general use a little bit longer. Uh, and I think they probably skew toward that way because Evernote's been available on mobile devices for a lot longer than, than OneNote has. Um, but there are pluses and minuses to each. Fred Kogler in uh, our Q&A section asked, well, okay, how much space does, the, does your cloud have? So any Office 365 subscriber uh, gets, I believe now, one terabyte of space, uh, which would be hard to fill up, you know, in, in my opinion, even if Seems you're throwing pretty adequate, huh? mo movies and such up on there. And just while we're talking about OneNote, and we'll cover Evernote here too, the cost of an Office 365 subscription, uh, what we pay is our is nonprofit pricing. It's 450 per user per month. There are regular subscriptions of about I think it's seven bucks per month per person, which not only gives you this online storage and OneNote, but it gives you the entire Office suite. So you could have Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, Outlook, all those things for seven bucks a month. For ten bucks a month. You can have a family subscription, and that's five copies. So up to five copies or five computers can have a full suite of Office, one terabyte of uh, Office space. So that's uh, you know that's 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 a pretty good deal. For sure. And I'm just looking on the Evernote site. Pricing is fairly comparable. You can get started for free, yep. um, but you can go with Evernote Premium for five dollars a month. Um, which gives you offline access and enhanced search features. And then um, Evernote Business is $10 per month per user. Right. So yep. business question there. Absolutely. You know, and maybe they have um, pricing for nonprofits as well. I'd have to look into that. To me, Evernote is very powerful. It does OCR scanning, so you can put PDFs in there and you be able to scan for content in your PDFs. It doesn't have the same um, kind of forced on you structure. And so if you're more of a free-for-all and just search for what you need, I think Evernote's perfect. It does have tagging and it does have kind of collections, but it doesn't have kind of the, the notebook folder page kind of concept that, that OneNote has. That's kind of why I defer to OneNote at this point. But I don't think you can go wrong with, with either one. So There are other players, though, Sally. Um, 
Uh, one that comes to mind that uh, that Google's been trying to push more and more is Keep, K E E P. Now that's a mobile only. Well, I shouldn't say it's mobile only. I think it's probably a, an extension in Chrome as well. I'd have to double check that since I haven't really tried it. I can't vouch for how how well it works, but that's something that you may want to check out if you're in that Google ecosystem. Along with, of course, Google Docs. Google Docs would allow you to take notes and store different stuff stuff on Google Drive. Yep, and you can also add to that list Deco. I think is is probably a player. Yep. Yeah, and I use Deco a lot for capturing links, and I, I'd be really lost without it. That's um, how I organize my links. I can create lists, and we have a Wells Tech group. There's all kinds of options with Deco, um, but I don't use the annotation options very much, and it does. it's very full-featured in that way as well. So you can highlight things. You can add notes. You can put sticky notes and all kinds of things um, within the Deco interface. So, yep. you know, if you're living there... Yep, Deagle's Deagle's a little bit different flavor because you have to actually start with existing content. So it has to be something that exists on the web that you can tag. So Mm -hmm. it's a blog post, it's a web page, it's something that you can throw into Deagle. And then you can do all the annotation and linking and putting in lists and those kinds of things. But I, to be honest, I I use OneNote, but for links, especially links that I'm going to share for conferences and whatever, I absolutely use Digo. I think it's a tremendous, tremendous tool. Um, and I mentioned Notability already. Actually, Notability was just in the news at the end of August because they had just been um, iPhone, iPad centric, where you can actually take notes. It has a, a recorder, so it's really popular with students because you can record audio and take notes at the same time of a lecture or whatever it may be. You can add images, you can draw in it. Lots of features with Notability on the iOS platform, but they just launched. A Mac version. So for ten dollars, you can get a Mac version, and you can sync between your phone and iPad and your Mac, and take notes on any of the devices. So um, popular niche kind of market, maybe for students or whatever that are attending a lot of lectures. Notability might be the option you want to look at. And not to leave, uh, although we haven't left the Mac folks out because we've talked about all these tools are, are cross-platform. One that's specific to Mac that gets a lot of play in this conversation is OmniFocus. Uh, OmniFocus and Omni Outliner are two applications, the good productivity applications that allow you to collect and store and do task management and and uh, do writing, uh, those kinds of things. Long-form writing is good for Omni Outliner. Um, those are not free tools um, and they're not subscription-based either, but they do work really well and you can find a lot of information about them on the good old internet, because there's a lot of OmniFocus uh, advocates out there who would uh, would be lost without it. So if you're looking for something that's purely a Mac experience, that might be a good place to start. So I'm curious what our listeners use and how they um, apply note-taking to their ministry situations. And so we'd love to hear from you if you're using an e-note-taking app or um, product and you know what the pluses and minuses are from your perspective. And how do they do that? Oh, wow, that would be great to tell them, wouldn't it? We have a website, wellstech.wells.net, and if you visit the website, there are lots of ways to communicate with us. Um, We have links for Facebook and Google+, and um, there's a way even right there on the screen to send us a voicemail, so we'd love to to actually hear your voice telling us about your experience. Uh, You can tweet us, you can add pins to our Pinterest page, or you can add a good old-fashioned comment right there on the website because there's always a way um, to comment at the um, end of the post. So um, just get in touch with us somehow and let us know what you're thinking. Now, special way to contact us for pastors is our <laughs> current pastor tech survey. You go to bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash pastor tech survey. We're very interested in collecting feedback, right now at least, especially for pastors uh, about their tech usage. And uh, we will have a a show that deals with pastor tech, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this survey. So there's about six, seven questions there. Uh, Leave as little or as much information as you want. Maybe one of those pieces of information is what kind of note-taking software do you use in your pastor's office? To incense you to do that, 
we have a giveaway. Good folks at Northwestern Publishing House have consented to and willingly allowed us to give away a copy of Imsoft Player 3.0. And I forget what value that what dollar value that is, but it's it's not insignificant. Two hundred forty nine ninety nine. So it's not every survey that's submitted, but we'll pick one at random to give the software away to. Excellent. Let's move on to news and tech. Sally, you uncovered some interesting news from Amazon that might be especially interested to teachers and parents. Absolutely. Amazon just unveiled their new line of Amazon Fire um, tablets, and there's a whole article and series of pictures and uh, kind of a review out on CNET about it. Um, the one that I found most interesting is that they have a couple of new tablets, a 6-inch and a 7-inch, that are specifically geared toward children. And um, one component that comes along with those tablets is something that is a, a channel, basically, kind of like their Amazon Prime, but kid-friendly. So it has uh, leveled readers, it has supplemental readers, it has educational apps, um, and video as well. So um, you can trust <laughs> that Amazon has vetted out this um, this channel that they're allowing and and um, I'm just going to switch screen. 129 bucks, right? Or something like that? I think it's 149, 149 is the price that I'm seeing here. Same for both. Yeah, and I was just trying to come up with the name of the channel. It has a certain name, uh, Free Time. Free Time Unlimited is what they're calling the kids' channel. So um, looks like it's well cushioned, hopefully against yeah, breakage. So that if uh, little Jimmy gets a little excited or is not as careful as you might be with a tablet, it uh, still probably has a glass screen, but if it falls, hits one of the corners or whatever, it's going to bounce pretty well. So. Right, and actually it has a two-year guarantee. So oh, that's um, right, I heard that. That's awesome. Two-year worry-free guarantee includes coverage for anything that happens. So if they drop it, Amazon's going to replace it for two years. Yeah, so That's a great deal. Looks like a really interesting tablet for children, and I can imagine a lot of kids would be excited. You get your choice of green, blue, or pink. So Fire HD Kids Edition. So yes. Nice, nice pickup there. I thought that was pretty neat. All right, moving on to our ministry resources section. And um, Sally, we've got some information that Aaron Fry has shared with us. Yeah, um, he uh, shared out on Google Plus the fact that Logos has flashcards for Greek and Hebrew. And I'm not sure, I think these are fairly new release from Logos. And uh, Aaron had good things to say about it. And I also found that Logos has other um, apps for um, mobile devices as well. This is There's actually a an iOS version as well as an Android version so you can find it in the Google Play Store as well and so if you're a student of Greek or Hebrew or both you might want to get the new uh, Logos flashcards. This looks um, very helpful for somebody just starting out trying to learn the language. Um, mm -hmm. Greek, Hebrew, it also has Aramaic, it has quizzes, it keeps track of your progress uh, you can time yourself, you can challenge yourself in, uh, amp up in degree of difficulty. And the price is absolutely right. It is a free, at least the one I'm looking at in the iTunes store, is free. So, yeah. Very cool. Thanks, Aaron. All right. That is our ministry resource. On to our tips and or picks of the week. Sally, I bet yours has something to do with <laughs> Apple iOS 8. Well, you just win the prize today, don't you, Martin? Um, it's because you're looking at the mind map. That's cheating. Actually, I should give you um, kudos because iOS 8 came out all in the news, and you actually saved on Digo, our Wells Tech uh, Digo page, a link to this, everything you need to know about iOS 8. Looks like a really great roundup from Lifehacker. Um, there's just, I, I would say the news was inundated with iOS 8, um, articles this weekend. It was pretty much everywhere you looked, you know, do this, get this app, um, find out how to use this new feature, all that kind of stuff. And they've kind of pulled it all together here in this Life 
Hacker article. So thanks, Martin, for sharing that. Um, the specific tip that I wanted to share has to do with LastPass and a couple of other apps and the fact that they actually will integrate with your Safari browser on your iPhone or iPad now. So this is huge for me because I store all my passwords in LastPass. And um, up until this point, I, c I have a LastPass app on my phone but I have to stop what I'm doing and go open the app and search for the password and copy it to my clipboard and then paste it into the browser. But now, after turning it on in the LastPass settings, I can use this little um, icon that's on the bottom of my phone screen. It looks like a, um, a box with an arrow pointing up. It's on the bottom bar in the browser. And when I click that, um, Typically, I get some options that pop up on the screen. Now, if you use the More button, um, your options to turn on things like Pinterest and Evernote are available, as well as LastPass. So you have to use the More button for both those rows. Some of them get lit up and are pretty in color, and others are in black and white. And LastPass is actually going to show up in the row that's in black and white. So you use the More button for that row. You turn on LastPass, so you slide the slider to make it green. And then um, when you click that button, LastPass will be an option there, um, right there within your browser. So I'm on a login page for a particular website. I click the button and touch LastPass, and it'll actually ask me to identify with my fingerprint, which is pretty typical on the iPhone. And then um, it will pass through those credentials to the page, and I'll get lo be logged in. I don't have to search for it. I don't have to copy and paste. I don't have to do anything. It just um, passes through the credentials to the page and, and submits them, and I get logged in. And that's just a life changer for a LastPass girl. So I was really excited that um, that came through with with iOS 8 and there's I'm pretty sure many other apps that are going to be taking care of that taking advantage of that capability to integrate more with the Safari browser Pinterest that being probably one. yeah that was probably the biggest feature um, addition you know iOS 8 as far as I'm concerned third parties one other one that I really like is third party keyboards mm -hmm. uh, so you're not stuck with the Apple keyboard which I had really some challenges with I don't know if my fingers just didn't move right or they were too fat or whatever but there's some good swipe keyboards uh, Swift keyboard is one of the big ones that learns it and does some predictive typing along with some swiping um, so that's the one that uh, that I'm using and um, just a big win another you mentioned it is uh, huge uh, the ability to just use your fingerprint your thumbprint or whatever so you don't have to type in that last pass password which should be strong uh, very strong and it's just a bummer to type in or you can kind of cut the corners and say remember it which is not real secure but if it allows you to just press your thumb there or finger and uh, that that's actually safer uh, because mm -hmm. you know you're the one that's doing it um, so that's a great feature as well um, iPhone 5s or 6 or 6 plus only for the fingerprint reader so yeah, and Not I have a 5S, either. so yeah. thankful it's working. Yeah. And yeah, it's just a, a really big plus for me to have LastPass working. I, I think that's a, a huge a huge gain. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Mm -hmm. All right, my uh, tip of the week is uh, pretty simple. Let me do a quick screen share of uh, Google. Everybody goes to that Google page to, to do their searching, and I'm uh, not excluded there. If uh, I do a search, let, let's say I wanted to learn a little bit more about how LastPass works on iOS. So if I was just to do a search on Google, LastPass on iOS, I'm going to come up with a lot of different uh, articles on LastPass and iOS. Um, but the news that I'm particularly interested in is the, the news that Sally just shared, that LastPass on iOS is improved. It can be integrated with iOS 8. How do I narrow down those results to be more um, useful? Well, under uh, the, at the top of the screen on your search results, you have web, videos, news, shopping, images, more, and search tools. If I go under search tools, three things pop up. 
any time with a little drop down which is going to allow me to select a uh, specific time all results which is visited pages not yet visited reading level verbatim or location and in this case I don't really care whether it knows I'm in Slinger or not because the results are pretty much going to be the same what I'm the tip that I'm that I'm offering is this anytime uh, option so if I click on anytime I can say anytime which is going to be obviously forever and I've got uh, I don't know how many results it returned but a lot of them mm -hmm. um, I think it was over, almost a half million results but I can narrow that down I can say past year past month past week past 24 hours past hour so and then you can do also do a custom range but I'm thinking that this news that I, since iOS just came out would be something fairly recent so maybe I would choose past 24 hours and sure enough I've got articles that are coming up that are far more relevant 12 hours ago one pass iOS 8 uses your fingerprint last pass blog out for I or last pass get last pass for iOS 8 today um, these are all going to be far more relevant than I had with just the universe there's even a iOS 8 uh, iPhone 6 YouTube video to show how it works there so the, the ability to kind of narrow your search to things that are more timely is really useful I use this all the time because I don't need to see uh, results that are five years old if I'm looking for something that's fairly current so get those out of my way no matter how popular they are just show me the latest and greatest and that seems to work on a fairly regular basis not always but it's a good first stab at trying to narrow your search down to relevant search results so you taught little, me something new it's you good stuff that, huh? I haven't and you know I've always had this perception that Bing is gives more timely results mm -hmm. so I wonder if the folks over at Bing just have last 24 hours turned on as the first results they return or whatever because you know if I'm disappointed in Google sometimes I'll pop over and open Bing and right. and give it a try there but I've never tried the anytime um, search option the you know narrowing that it's interesting that you that you brought up Bing because that's one thing I don't like about Bing is yeah I think it's more I think it's more timely results but they don't give you the granular control Ah. Google does here. I've looked for it. I've even, I've even written Microsoft through their feedback loop, saying, "Hey, where is this feature? Am I missing it? Can't I narrow it down by the past 24 hours, or week, or month? Or uh, because I have not found that in Bing. So that's mm -hmm. why I kind of like Google for that. So interesting. Good to know. Excellent. Thank you. All right, let's move along to uh, Wells Insider section. Yep, and we want to just share with our um, listeners today that um, the Shopwell's Insider newsletter is available for subscription. And uh, if you aren't familiar with Shopwell's, it's a great way to find out discount pricing for all kinds of products that are appropriate for church and school purchase and many that are um, for individuals as well, where we've basically um, taking the power of numbers, the fact that we are a large group of congregations and schools and negotiated with various vendors for special pricing. And um, we promote that on a regular basis through the Insider Newsletter. And we have a subscription page that we want to share with you where you can get subscribed to the Shopwell's Insider Newsletter. I think one's going to be coming out pretty soon, Martin. Next month, next two, three weeks even. Um, so it comes out four times a year. It comes out quarterly. Um, the winter edition is in paper format and gets mailed to all call our uh, not all call workers all churches and schools and of course it's available in digital format the other three times a year uh, and this one would be the fall edition are in electronic format so if you want to take advantage of that it's a little four it's a quick read four pages gives you some of the newest vendors some of the newest uh, discounts available some specials from some of our vendors um, that's going to be coming up in the uh, fall edition of the Shopwell's Insider in the digital form. So easy to subscribe. Uh, just check the link in the show notes or just go to shopwells.net and there's a subscribe uh, to the Shopwell's Insider button there. So that's our Wells Insider tip of the week. 
Excellent. We also have some things you need to know, including the fact that we are looking for iPhone 4 donations for the Malawi mission field. Um, our missionaries in Malawi have identified the fact that it would be much easier to communicate with national pastors if they were able to um, give the pastors an iPhone. Um, they can't carry computers out in the bush with them very easily, but if they had this cell phone technology that they could take advantage of, it would be a, a real boost to the mission field. And so uh, we're looking for donations of used iPhones, um, and I believe they have to be on certain carriers, Martin. AT&T or T-Mobile, is that correct? That's correct. It has to be on the GSM network because that's the only network that would work in that area. Or if you have an unlocked GSM phone, doesn't have to. If it's not locked, AT&T or T-Mobile. If it is, then they can unlock it. But if it is already unlocked, that's great too. Send that to the Senate office, and we'll have uh, information on that. There is a a, a Wells.net page that you can find where where to send that uh, iPhone for, and of course chargers, and if you've got cases, that kind of stuff. Uh, very useful for the national pastors to communicate. Uh, it's so expensive to communicate there in Africa, and this would just be a great uh, benefit to, to their ministries if they had these uh, iPhone 4s at their disposal. Excellent. You also need to know that our call for presenters for the Wells Tech Conference 2015 is winding down. We are hoping to uh, close that option just one week from now on September 30th. So um, it's your time to uh, tell us what you can present, what success stories in tech and ministry you can share, and um, Potentially, you'll get selected as a breakout presenter and get free admittance to the Wells Tech Conference 2015, which is next July, July 9th through 11th at Country Springs Hotel and Conference Center in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I'm looking forward to it. So get your submissions in. There's no guarantee that yours would be selected. We will let everybody know uh, what kind of fills out the agenda. We begin getting a lot of feedback, which is which is wonderful. So. Speaking of feedback, we have feedback from our faithful Wells Tech listeners. <laughs> Some from Pinterest. Is this you, Sally? <laughs> faithful Wells Tech view? listener. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to listen. It's my job. But I love listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, yes, via Pinterest, a couple of pins. One was an interesting infographic, tips for online students to work successfully in virtual groups. And uh, I am a mom of high schoolers, and both of them are taking online classes this school year. You know, it's becoming more and more prevalent, and I see it from the other angle because I also teach online classes, and it can be a real challenge to transition from traditional teaching to online teaching, especially... Um, fostering some connectivity between the students when they're all in different places and don't really know each other face to face. So I thought this really simple infographic gave some great ideas. Um, things like uh, choose a group leader who's comfortable taking on that role, be proactive and begin setting the groundwork early. Online learners, um, your time is extremely precious and you know trying to coordinate the time against different um, schedules and things like that. There's just lots of little simple tips here um, to help with working in groups and um, doing things together collaboratively um, in that online setting. So check out the infographic and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. Next up, an article from Educational Technology and Mobile Learning, Two iPad Google Apps Few Know Nothing About. And um, one of them is the Google Authenticator, which is useful in the two-step authentication process. So if you've set up that two-step verification where you have to require both a password and a verification code and that kind of thing, um, this app will help you through that. The other is for Google administrators, and you can actually log in and do some administrative functions like user management, group management, and checking out audit logs. So you can do that from your mobile device with these two um, iPad apps. Very good. Yeah, we've yeah. talked about Authenticator. I think that was maybe a pick a while back. And usually a good idea to have that uh, two-factor, two-step authentication installed as long as you are... You've got a smartphone with the app installed. LastPass has that available. That's especially important if you use LastPass to, to doubly protect that password. Um, many sites are, are allowing that now. I think Facebook even does it. So. 
And then lastly, we wanted to link, um, lastly from Pinterest, to a Google Docs cheat sheet. And I thought this was pretty thorough um, cheat sheet that, that they've developed from Shake Up Learning, where they've just identified everything, all the different components that are a part of Google Docs and um, all the different menu options, things that you can do from the different menu options, um, different add-ons that you can use with Google Docs, and lots of other features. So um, if you're new to Google Docs or perhaps you're using it for the first time in your classroom, this may be a good um, PDF document to download and use as a reference. Very good. All right. I um, just want to let everybody know uh, I got an email recently from Tom Plumman up at the core in Appleton. Uh, we mentioned it, I think, uh, maybe a few shows back, but uh, they're holding a conference, SEEK conference, and uh, it's on October 3rd in Appleton, SEEKconference.com. I am going to do a presentation on some of the things that we talk about here at Wells Tech, um, some things that uh, where, where ministry meets uh, technology. So. You are free on October 3rd and are in the southeast or middle Middle East Wisconsin mm -hmm. area. Uh, that may be something that you'd want to check out. Excellent. Um, next up, some links from Digo, our friend Ryan Rosenthal, who teaches at Faith in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, shared a couple of links for um, social science and science type teachers. Um, Discovery Kids Earth section, which has a lot of great um, games and activities around um, planet Earth stuff. There's videos there, there's facts to learn, all kinds of fun stuff here. So check that out. Um, and also from Ryan, a link to free technology for teachers, 10 online activities and resources for Geography Awareness Week. So if you are a geography teacher, perhaps you want to check out some of the links here. Um, GeoGuessr and overlap maps and place spotting and math trail and photopedia reporter so a lot of geolocation kind of fun um, looks like from the apps that are a part of this article so check it out if you're looking for geography resources um, I also tagged a page on Digo 20 awesome bring your own device mobile learning apps. So this is from the perspective of teachers who may be doing bring your own device type things in their classroom and they have a mixture of iPads and Surface tablets and Chromebooks and Macs and whatever other devices. So they're looking for some common ground. And look Martin, right away they talk about Microsoft OneNote and Evernote being available on them. Um, it kind of covers different um, areas. There's ebooks, there's writing activities, syncing in the cloud. She really recommends Dropbox as kind of a workhorse there. And then um, taking screenshots and using Skitch for that. So this is more um, non platform centric apps. So you can do it on whatever device shows up in your classroom. I wonder if any Wells classrooms are bring your own device fully with their one to one. I've heard of a few. I actually have, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, I just picked up on an article from, or a, a post from Tom Rosenau over on Google Plus about church video license, cvli.com. Martin, I didn't have this one tagged in my personal Digo library. I'm not sure if we talked about this before or not, but it's a, a flat fee per student or per congregation member to be able to show videos um, in a public setting like your classroom or your congregation events. So church video license, um, check that out. I want to say that Tom wrote something like $1.50 per student is very reasonable to be able to play all these movies. So um, seemed like reasonable pricing. Great. And then um, also a mention about uh, the Wells Tech Listserv and the fact that Ryan Rosenthal asked for an iPad app to let him control PowerPoint. And there was kind of an overwhelming response that um, the app that they use is called, and I don't see it here, it's Shark, Slide Shark. I think I brought up, brought up the wrong one, and some people had some other ideas as well. But I think the one that most people recommended was Slide Shark. So, and I believe it is a free app, so you might want to check that out if you're looking to project um, PowerPoints using your iPad. That's it. That's interesting. Um, now that depends on what you're doing. I know my wife uses something called Splash Top. I believe it's Splash Top. Mm -hmm. It allows you to remotely control your your Mac. 
-hmm. which is then connected to the projector. So the Mac is running PowerPoint, um, you know, the Office 365 version of PowerPoint, or even the native version. And so she has control over it from her iPad, which she can move around the room with, which is the advantage of something like that. Point at things and those kinds of things. So. Someone else had mentioned um, Dosery. I think um, Gail maybe had shared Dosery with us before. And it says that it allows you to control the computer over Wi Fi and works really well with PowerPoint. So That's it's another awesome. option. Yeah, okay. Fred Kogler uh, sent us another message here. I found out that, of, and this is, I think, in reference to the, the first uh, Pinterest uh, feedback you provided, Sally. I found out that of seven individuals working with me on online instruction, the, rea the reaction was all over the board. Four resisted the notion of wanting to share their identity with other students. Thus, the advantage of sharing was very limited. Well, that makes sense, I guess. So it's uh, it's it's going to vary, I think, by by groups. Sure. So wanting to work in those virtual environments and kind of be all out there or not. So. Right, and I guess it kind of depends on the scenario you're teaching in as right. well. You know, obviously high school students taking classes for credit, they don't have a choice. They have to have a voice in the class and, you know, tell who they are. And, and you know, I know for classes I've taught here at MLC, you know, it's a requirement to comment and share your opinions and things like that. And so um, helping to ease students into that um, giving them some some icebreaker type things and getting them comfortable with the environment, I think, is kind of the focus of that um, infographic. Yep, yep. So that's community feedback. Wellstech.wells.net is a place to go if you'd like to leave some feedback. We have a Facebook page, Twitter hashtag uh, hashtag Wellstech, uh, Pinterest, of course, Digo. Um, just all kinds of options, or just send us a good old-fashioned email. That would be fine, too, wellstech at wells.net. Sally, I am excited about next week's show because it's been a while since we've had a classroom technology-focused show. We have Gil Potratz joining us again, talk a little bit about education technology, talk about maybe adoption of Google Apps in the classroom by faculty, uh, getting them up to speed and some of her experiences, maybe talking a little bit about Google Classroom, just generally get us started uh, on a good foot talking about classroom technology. So tune in next week for our classroom technology focused show as Gail joins us once again. Looking forward to that. Yes, most definitely. I always enjoy Gail and Jason uh, when they're on the show for educational technology. We have some videos to close out our show, but before we do that, Martin, I have to ask about the picture on the wall behind you. Did you take that? Uh, yes, I took that picture. Wow. That is in, uh, I'm going to forget the, the name of the place, but that's in New Mexico. Beautiful. Nice yeah. job. Thanks. All right. Enjoy um, this. No, it's one of the few that I uh, was proud enough to actually put on canvas and put on my wall, although it's down here in the basement in my home office. So I don't <laughs> okay. tell you anything, so. <laughs> Very nice. Anyway, I enjoy it. All right. Three videos, not one today, folks. It's all going on our product demos um, playlist, and it covers the topic of e-note taking. So we've got something about Google Keep, we've got Evernote, and uh, some introduction to the iOS 8 options with the OneNote app for iPhone and iPad. So uh, we covered all the biggies, and uh, hope you enjoy the videos and, and that they help you make a decision and perhaps adopt an e-note taking option. Very good. Uh, we hope to see all of you back next week. If you'd like to tune in live, we'll be back on our regular Tuesday late afternoon uh, show, 4 p.m. Central Time. If not, uh, catch us on iTunes, Stitcher. Um, you can just go to the page, wellstech.wells.net. We're on wells.net as well. Uh, all kinds of places to grab our stuff, and uh, we're happy that you do. Please uh, stay tuned and keep... Uh, Keep spreading the word that Wells Tech is out here for anybody looking for technology tips, tricks, uh, direction as it relates to their ministry. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>